of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, for us tonight. Bless her heart. She really gave her all and it's an upgrade from the cookies I would have brought from the store. So be thankful for Ivan. And each, each one on the board is responsible for a program each month during the times that we meet and Vicki Zimmer is the one who is uh, brought this program to us tonight and so she's going to do the introduction. <clears throat> Hugh Hageman is going to be our speaker tonight, but I learned that there are going to be others who are speaking too. So he's expanded his repertoire by inviting some others, which is great. I think that's wonderful. Hugh and um, Lee have been living on their ranch their whole married life, and it's west of Fort Laramie. And I've uh, known the Hageman family through Marion and her husband, through my dad, who was in the legislature with him. So we've known the Hagemans for a long, long time, and they um, are a great asset to Goshen County. A lot of things that you don't know about them, they do behind the scenes. And uh, I am glad to, to be able to call them friends. So today, um, Hugh's going to talk about their ranch and um, some of the pioneers that were instrumental in um, getting the ranches together in, in the early days and kind of how our, our uh, county has developed through those early, early people that were here. So without further ado, Hugh and company. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki, and uh, I, I thank you all for inviting me here tonight. It's, uh, it's quite a bit out of my comfort zone, but I really do appreciate you doing that because when I have to do something like this, it makes me go back to all that history that I read either a long time ago or listened to my dad tell stories about, and you forget a lot of things. So in the last few days when I started going back through some of this stuff, you really get you start really getting into it and start learning things that you didn't know or things that you haven't read for 20 years and so I really do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, by the looks of the crowd I better make some of it interesting because <laughs> some of you came a long ways in the cold. So first off I'd like to introduce my mother uh, Marion Hageman. She's the one that she didn't quite start at all but she's she's the uh, third generation so, Marion Hageman. Uh. Well, Julie asked me if I wanted to say something, and at first I said, oh no. And then I said, well, yes, I do want to say something. <laughs> Did you know that Wyoming was one of the first states in the United States to have irrigation districts? Oh. Are you okay? Go ahead and talk. Okay. And you, and you don't have to do it now, but go ahead. Okay. Well, anyway, um, 
I was up in New Orleans one day with Harriet. She was traveling around the state, and she's on the Warland Irrigation District Board, and they had a private meeting. So they said, you can sit in this room until we're done. And if you take any books off of the shelves, you leave them on the table. Don't try to put them away. And that whole room was full of record books. So I picked out a couple. And I sat there, and it was the best three hours I've ever had. One of the best few hours I ever had. That story was the most interesting thing. Those are the two oldest irrigation districts in this state. Buffalo Bill and, uh, what's the one? Warland. At Warland, and what's the other one? This one down here. Platt. Oh, Platt, Platt, Platt River. Platt River two oldest districts in this state. And the pictures in that book, the uh, photographs, they had to capture those people to work there because it was so hard. The work was, uh, they had to carve out the uh, rock and they would lay on their backs. And a lot of them were, uh, had been in jail, so they wouldn't take them back into town because they'd disappear. <laughs> and the work was so hard that and made so uncomfortable, so no wonder they had to capture their uh, workforce. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just wanted you to know that this is the two oldest irrigation districts in Wyoming are uh, Buffalo Bill and the Platte. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm so happy to be in, in Goshen County. When we left Converse County, I said, oh, we'll be back. And we never went back to the county. We've lived here ever since our family was raised here. And Jim said, I am glad to raise my family in Goshen County. Yeah. Now my sister Julia Newman here, son Lane, my wife Lee, another son Brett, and we have Charlie here, and Charlie is the sixth generation of our family to be in Wyoming. Uh, my great-grandfather brought a trail herd from Texas in 1879 and that was the first that my family had come to Wyoming. He hired on with a, a trail outfit in Texas, and at that time they took most of the cattle to Ogallala, and in Ogallala they, they split them, they took the uh, cows and calves, came to Wyoming, the smaller steers stayed to go back out on grass, and he helped them take all the big steers up to the Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And so once he got those delivered, he and three others went from South Dakota to Fort Laramie because his brother had come up with a trail herd the year before and he wanted to meet up with him. And that was, uh, it was always interesting to, if you think about no telephones, no letters, no anything in, a, in five or six months of trail drive and then meet someone on a, in a roundabout certain sort of a date in a certain area and they did it and they made it work and he'd never even been to Fort Laramie. So. That was just a few miles from where I grew up. And then he, he, settled on a, he settled on a ranch up near Orange Junction, and that's where he began to build his uh, cattle herd. He worked for, at, at that time, all of the, uh, uh, most of the cattle in the ranches were owned by foreigners, a lot of Englishmen, and, and he worked for, for two partners. One was Test Matcher, I can never say it right, and DeBillier and they were foreigners, and most of the cattle were, were owned by foreigners. They, they invested in cattle. All of the range was free. It was all open range. And then uh, along came, they wanted me to kind of give you how the cattle industry evolved, and I think one of the biggest things that ever happened to the cattle industry was in uh, 1887, 1886-87, was a horrible winter, and it, uh, it just wiped out almost all of the foreign investors and so it was it 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 changed two to three things two for sure 
it took out the foreign investors and then it also uh, the ranchers decided which which that made the the land be broken up and homesteaded and so that made it so local people owned the land uh, the land was beginning to be owned instead of just run on free range but it also started basically what Wyoming is all about and it started people decided if they wanted to uh, ranch in Wyoming they better figure out a way to raise feed and so that's when they started thinking about irrigation and uh, that's one of the probably the biggest change that ever came to Wyoming was when they decided to to raise feed uh, my dad he he did a lot of writing and I was going through his writings and there was there was one writing that he that he put together that I always thought was one of the most interesting and I it always really gets people to thinking because uh, to, to really understand Wyoming and why Wyoming was settled I thought it gave you know one of the best pictures there is and I wasn't going to read much tonight but I don't know how to to get to it without get the points out I'll just I don't know if that fits or not. I'll try to read with. Uh, this is from my dad. And he had been asked to be on uh, what was called the Ruckle House Institute. It was an, an environmental, it, when the environmental movement was first starting, the University of Wyoming decided they would have a, put together a panel. And these were a panel of people from all over the United States and all different aspects of uh, industry. Uh, occupation and I think dad was the only rancher and so he decided when he would go to those board meetings he would take a uh, he would write something beforehand and uh, hand it out to all of them and just just give them different things to think about and he was a real asset on that board and it's changed a lot since then I don't know that they have the common sense and the whatnot in the environmental movement that they have now but he he did all he could to uh, get them to understand the agriculture. Um, this is from Jim Hageman. Several years ago, the Institute of Environment and Natural Resources of the University of Wyoming met in the evening at a private home south of Centennial, west of Laramie. It was a beautiful late August evening. The valley spread out below was emerald green with many cows out grazing. You could see water sparkling here and there spread from irrigation ditches. Several of the people there had not been to Wyoming, or at least spent much time here. They were so impressed with the sight spread out below them, so beautiful the mountains behind them, and the beautiful, useful valley below. I told the group that that valley wasn't green to make it pretty, but that man had worked really hard to bring water from some creek and had built a network of ditches in that rocky land, not for aesthetic purposes to make our view better, but to make his cows comfortable. That started me to thinking how making a cow comfortable had changed Wyoming from a near desert to a quite hospitable, pleasant place to live. My grandfather, Jim Shaw, my mother's father, worked for an outfit that brought 4,400 head of cattle from South Texas to Ogallala, Nebraska in 1879. They divided the herd there, the cows going to the ranchers to be used as breeding stock, the smaller steers going back on grass, and grandfather helped deliver the big steers to the Indian Reservation in South Dakota. He and three others then headed to Fort Laramie as his brother Tom had come up the trail the year before and was working near there. There were no roads and very few people living in that area, so it was quite difficult getting to Fort Laramie. <clears throat> My family has been involved in the history of Wyoming. Most of the cattle at that time were owned by large investors who ran their cattle on open range. The grass was free and the cattle were expected to thrive on what they could graze. Not much effort was made to supply them with water or supplemental feed. My grandfather was a roundup foreman for the Wyoming stock growers in 1884. They never had to gather the whole country as the cattle could only graze where they could get back to water every day. This really limited the area that needed to be gathered. For instance, most years there was no water from the Platte to the Niobrara River near Lusk. To the west, there was water on Rawhide, and to the east there was some on Sheep Creek, but there was a 30-mile strip where there was no water. Most years there was no water from the Platte at Douglas to the Cheyenne River, and not much water there, and on through Campbell County. Bill Eastman, who ran sheep and cattle north of Douglas, told me that in 1934, the only water in that country were trenches that they dug by hand in the Cheyenne River bed. 
They brought the bands of sheep in every third day and watered them. Imagine what this did to antelope. The tough winter of 1887 changed the attitude of the serious livestock people. It eliminated a lot of foreign owners. It shifted the ownership of livestock to smaller operators that, who lived here. These people recognized that they owed something to make their cattle more comfortable. They recognized that they must raise winter feed if the cows were to be comfortable enough to survive and show a profit. In order to raise feed, they would have to use snow runoff and rainwater to irrigate this arid land. They built irrigation systems to divert this water out to the lands and created meadows. This water, instead of being part of the floods on the way to the oceans, was being soaked into the ground. It then seeped back to the streams and kept them alive, and fisheries and wetlands were created. There was only one game fish, the cutthroat trout in Wyoming, when Grandfather came. There was almost no habitat for fish. The habitat for fish was created by man trying to make cattle comfortable, and it is still keeping water in our streams. That is why the legislature is so apprehensive about in-stream flow. You let water go down the creek and it is gone. Only storage keeps the creeks alive. Most of the water still rushed to the Gulf of Mexico or the Pacific Ocean, gone in a couple of months. Man saw a need to build dams on the rivers and irrigate larger tracts of land. Pathfinder Dam and large irrigation projects are a good example to store the water and create irrigation districts in Nebraska and Wyoming. They could raise feed to complement the cattle running on grass, and it did, except for sugar beets and dry beans, most all of the crops did go for making cattle comfortable, and still does. Water that had been unusable that contributed to floods and erosion was still in Wyoming and Nebraska. Rivers like the Platte could grow trees, floodplains were no longer blow sand, but now habitat for geese, ducks, and deer. Large recreation areas were created. Cheap, clean electricity was made available, and rivers were alive year-round instead of a muddy flood in May and June. Millions of trees found a home, and hundreds of acres of wetlands were created. No longer did streams originating in Wyoming contribute to floods on the Mississippi, and all because the government thought raising feed for livestock was important. So that, that basically, there's another page, but, uh, and I can get copies of this, but that's, that's basically what started Wyoming, was, was the, need, the need for the cow, and then it just, it snowballed from there, and when they started irrigating, it changed, changed all of the creeks, it changed the rivers, and it changed, so that was, that was his point, was it was, it was for the evolution of the cow. So, then, uh, my grandfather, he worked for several people and then he started that ranch up by Orange Junction. And he was in the open range days and he, he ran cattle all over Wyoming in the, in, the, in the open range. He would have up to five chuck wagons running at once and he, he ran cattle all over. Uh, I read an article once where he had, he had uh, uh, sold 600 head of horses to one, on one transaction to one outfit in South Dakota and trailed them up there just sold to one ranch, it sold. Uh, he had, uh, he was born in 1852, and he had seven children, and my grandmother was the uh, youngest. So, he was born in 1852, she was born in about 1903, so he was 51 years old when she was born, and she lived to be 96, so she died in 2000, so from 1852 until the year 2000, there, were only, it, there was a span of two generations in that 148 years. So that contributed an awful lot of history to my family because uh, uh, my grandmother loved history, my dad loved history, and they told us stories from the time we were little kids. So, and she had it firsthand because she knew her dad. And uh, I always figured she was probably the only living soul uh, that, that, still, that, that her dad had trailed the cattle from all the way from Texas. And uh, so anyway, uh, in researching some of that, I did find something that I, I did not know in this book. I had always heard, and Dad had said that they brought 4,400 head of cattle up from Texas, which I thought was... It was quite a few head, and there were only 11 of them. And I really could not, I just couldn't fathom how they could do that with 11 people. Well, I, I read, let's see if I can find it. 
uh, I read in here that it was even worse than that. It said, by accident, Jim Shaw had joined up with one of the largest trail contracting outfits operating out of Texas. Ellison and Sherrill owned and operated by two noted cattlemen, James H. Sherrill and James F. Ellison. Richard Dick Withers, trail boss for Ellison and Sherrill, was in charge of the drive of 5,500 head. Shaw noted only 4,800 uh, of Longhorns, the largest herd ever seen on the trail. And I did not know that until today when I found that in the back of this book. Uh, he had written, but I, I didn't know he had the largest, was on the largest trail drive ever brought up from Texas. But this is a book that he wrote, and uh, they're hard to come by. Vicki found me several of them. For years and years and years, we didn't know. I, I had seen one once when I was a kid, but uh, Vicki found some of these, and we did get one for each of the kids, but this was written by my great-grandfather. And uh, the sad part, I guess, was it's, it's up through his, till he's about 30 years old. And then he wrote down all of his memoirs. I think he lived till he was 91, 92. And he had from when he was 30 years old all in manuscripts to be published in another book. And the publishing place burned down, burned it all up. So it was never found. But anyway, this is him. And he was, uh, I say he lived till he was 92. He had gotten, when he was around 60 years old, uh, like I say, he'd run chuck wagons all over Wyoming, and that Wyoming, I think that would have been around 1906, 1907, Wyoming got into a really severe drought where there was just nothing left. And he shipped 5,000 cows down into Nebraska to winter because there was no feeding left in Wyoming. Down in Nebraska, the cows got to have big bellies. And coming from this short grass country where they'd never eaten hay, these small-bellied cows from short grass country could not eat enough of that slough grass down in Nebraska to stay alive. They couldn't get enough nutrition. They couldn't, if the, the cows in Nebraska are, are uh, accustomed to it, and they can take on a big enough load to get the nutrition. He lost them all. Uh, they thought there might be two or three hundred head left out of the whole deal. But it broke him when he was uh, 60 years old, I think, or 61. And he lost everything, but uh, his wife would never let him mortgage the house and 40 acres. And he lost, he lost everything but the house and 40 acres. Well, he died when he was 91. He had it all back. So um, he, he landed in a, tough, a little bit of a tough spot up there. Uh, the railroad got him. Then uh, Glendo Dam got him with eminent domain. And that moved, when Glendo Dam backs up, it, the, the homestead's still there, it's still in the family, not our family. My dad's first cousin got that ranch. And it's a really nice ranch, raised really nice cattle there, but they do get flooded when Glendo Reservoir gets high. And they're all under a flood plain there. It goes, goes up and fills the basement of their house every so many years. But anyway, they are still there. Uh, Mom and Dad, I think, got married around 1956, and they leased a sheep ranch 50-some miles out north of Douglas in Converse County. And they were there five years. And I think they saw the wettest year on record and the driest year on record in those five years. Um, 1961, they came to Goshen County, but... Uh, Dad was telling me one time, a friend of his said, uh, Jim, how long were you out there on that ranch? And Dad said, five years. He said, oh my gosh, you can't do anything in five years. And Dad said, when I went there, I didn't have a penny. And when I left there, I had four kids and a thousand head of sheep. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, well, I guess you can do something in five years. <laughs> uh, they came to, we came to Goshen County in 1961. Um, I was born in February of 61. I think we moved down in the summer of 61, so. Uh, brought all those sheep down to Goshen County. They didn't like it. And the sheep did not like Goshen County. <laughs> we, uh, uh, this is, uh, well, I can't really point to it. 
down to the left there is where this homestead sits, and that is where we, uh, that's where we landed, up in there in the Haystack Hills. And it's, it's extremely rough country, uh, very tough to sheep fence, you can't sheep fence it. And those sheep spent all their time climbing over that, those big hills, trying to go back to Douglas, trying to go back to Converse County. <laughs> And he lived with them day and night, and the, the predators were awful. They're still all over the ranch. There you be big, tall cedar posts out there where he would hang lanterns all around the sheep. He'd bed them down at night, and he'd hang lanterns, and he lived in the sheep wagon, and we would go visit him sometimes. And Mom loved taking all six. She had, they had two more kids as soon as they got down to Goshen County, and she loved taking all six kids out to camp all night and chase sheep in the dark and shoot predator and she could tell you stories about that but anyway he lived with them day and night and he couldn't keep the predators out and he couldn't keep them from from trying to go back so there was no telephone they did get electricity the first year we lived there um, no telephone uh, so the communication was unbelievable I still don't know how they communicated the way they did but those sheep would go over the hill and they'd head back north and west of Hartville and head up into that area up there and dad would get a letter from somebody say hey I saw some of your sheep over here and so he'd load his horse in the in the pickup stock rack and uh, he would it was seven miles of trail road down to the highway down to highway 26 and back through Guernsey and Hartville and he'd go up in there and he would he'd rope the sheep and tie them down and then he'd drive his pickup to them and he would load them and uh, if he had too many, then he'd have to go back and get his horse. And I, I, I don't know how he stood the. It, it's a long ways, you know, a long ways over there. But anyway, he did that, and afterwards he said, you know, I don't think it was very profitable. He said, when I sold those sheep, I only got $12 a head for them. But he sold those sheep to a guy clear over in Sabeel Canyon, and he agreed to trail them over there. And... Well, I, I mean, up until the day Dad was gone, they were telling stories about. That's when he got to know Bert Grieve. Some of you might know Bert Grieve. Uh, he was the guy that lived where we live now. And he and Bert and some of uh, his kids, and uh, we were all too little. But uh, they trailed those sheep from up there in the hills. They trailed them into where we live now the first night. And then they just went from there and went across to Wayland Dam. And they, they trailed them all the way over there. I don't remember how many days it took them, but they never had any. Uh, never had a plan and never knew anybody. They would just see where they wound up every day and, and uh, sometimes they'd come across an old krell and pen them for the night and sometimes they wouldn't and sometimes they did. And they came across a guy over there uh, somewhere way over in there and the guy was extremely grumpy and uh, dad asked if he, could, if he could keep the sheep there overnight and the guy was just almost so mad he couldn't hardly talk to him. Well he finally agreed to let him keep his sheep there overnight and like oh must have been 20 years later or something I'd least we'd lease some pasture up there in, uh, uh, south of Key Line and and met an old guy up there and and uh, what had happened was that guy had come through with his sheep the year before and and when he camped overnight it was two months later that he came back to get the sheep so dad figured out why he was so unhappy but um, we could run through those pictures real quick, Jerry, and Let's see if I can get this going here. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it is a right-handed projector and I'm left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Am I not hitting the right button? Okay, Mr. Tech. Tech person. <laughs> How come that that's not moving? Oh, Cal. Get there. Okay. I think we got it. Is that the right picture? Oh. <laughs> That was the day we branded a few years ago, and we just, the house is off to the south and west, and we just got to the pasture where we start gathering. 
that's what we call the Haystack Hills back in there, and that's the, uh, this old house is where, just back in those hills there. That's up near those hills, just gathering cattle. My brother Jim and I. Same area. Now we've got a, uh, we've got some pasture up near Meadowdale, north of Hartville, and we trail those cows up there and back. Uh, trail them up there in the spring and bring them back in the in the winter, and that. Uh, that's right at the top of the hill. There's, there's a big hill right west of Rawhide Butte, and it has an old road that switchbacks all the way to the top. And it's, it's extremely steep and rocky. And I think what that road was for is I think that's where they got the stone for the rock quarry and JM. Do you know, Linda? I think that's where they, they, got, I think they got, some. Got, got some of that stone for the rock quarry that they used to have in, the in JM. The the that's my daughter and on the right and myself. And it was cold. That was bringing them home. And that was uh, when we got there with them in the spring. That's coming into what we call the Woodruff Place. It used to be part of the O10 over there. Just taking them out in the spring. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, it looked like snow out there. All those sand lilies came. I think it was kind of after we'd broken the drought. And gathering in the, in the fall. That being what we call the old Myers place. That was just the crew that we had when we trailed them up. Shipping. That's the old homestead, right after mom remodeled it. <laughs> George can speak to that one. Um, let's see. There was, when we moved there in, uh, 61, I don't know if Dad knew or not, or if you guys knew, but the, uh, the area that we had moved into was it just unbelievable history. I mean, it, it, everywhere you look and everything you go across, it's either teepee rings. The Cheyenne Deadwood Stage Trail comes through the old fort and comes all the way across the place. Um, the old Charlie Myers place. Um, the there was a guy by the name of Edgar Bronson, and he came out here in the 1880s, and he was from back east, and he was a, as he described it in his book, he was a real tenderfoot. He had never, he had, he'd never done any cowboying. He hardly even ridden a horse, and he decided to become a cowboy. And he hired on with an outfit and uh, worked for an outfit several years and then started his own. His name was Charles Bronson. Has a really interesting book, um, Reminiscence of a Ranch Man. And I don't know if any of you knew Paul Soderberg, they had the Rawhide Ranch up there by Rawhide Butte. Anyway, he was telling me about this, but this, uh, and George knew all about him, but he was the very first cattle wintered north of the Platte River in this country, was right here on this place. And it was this uh, Edgar Bronson established a ranch right there. Uh, Mom always wondered if his dugout was part of this house. George thinks it was more up in, in McGinnis Gap and uh, that he, with the research and whatnot that George has done, but the, which would be right west of here up against the hills. But the, that was the very first cattle ever wintered north of the Platte River were wintered right on this place and that was his, his ranch. Well, 
Years later, Paul Soderberg ran into a guy that I, I, don't, I don't know what the connection was or what the connection that guy had to, to uh, Edgar Bronson, but Paul bought the brand. When he had the brand, it was called the Three Crows. And they had a crow on the shoulder and, the, and then two crows on the, on the rib. And then later in years, they dropped the crow on the shoulder, but the Soderbergs had that brand, the Two Crow. And that was Edgar Bronson's brand all those years when he, he started this ranch and then he went over by Fort Robinson and started a ranch over there. And uh, a couple of years, Paul came by the house and sold me the brand. So we started putting the Two Crow, we put the Two Crow on some calves last spring for the first time. But that was the original, the guy that had started to, or had the ranch originally and he was the first one to ever winter cattle north of the Platte River. So uh, that's, a very, that's a very fascinating, fascinating book. Uh, this one of my great grandfathers is, uh, it's unbelievable. And, it, and the one story I was reading today was about, a, was about one of his first roundups what, when he got here and when they round up in the spring. And, uh, you know, I hate to, hate to do all that reading, but it was it, it just, just pretty, pretty fascinating the way he described it. And he describes, when they went out, it was, it was amazing how organized it was. He was in charge of the group that went to North Platte City and then to the South Platte in Colorado. So you can see what kind of an area he had and he gathered that area and the next guy from from there he gathered back to Fort Laramie uh, the next one was Fort Fetterman back to Deer Creek and Fort Laramie and it was he said it was uh, most un, in here he just said is the most unbelievable sight he'd ever seen he left there was 150 cowboys took off on the one deal and uh, one of the bosses asked one if he knew a, a certain area, and he did, and he said, you got to get there and get there quick. And uh, so they headed out there. He said they headed out there to hard run, and he got up on a high hill to watch when, when he got to his spot, but he got up on a high hill, and he said it looked like uh, cavalrymen chasing Indians because he said those cattle, of course, they're turned loose from the, uh, from the fall before and hardly see anybody. But he said there was 150 cowboys, and they had uh, they had gone at a hard run for 10 miles to turn that bunch of cows. And when they mailed them, they had 5,000 head in that in that one roundup. And they mailed them and got them turned. He said it did. It takes some incredible cowboys to turn that bunch of cows back, and brought them in. But they uh, the one guy they were he just talked about other people and they're you know criticizing this one guy he said he makes a mistake he always wants to throw them all together and when they throw them together they'd be six thousand head and he'd say boy would it take some cowboys to sort and cut but uh, each ranch would send a rep and he repped for uh, this FM Phillips outfit but they'd send a rep and then that's when they gathered those cattle they had to know whose brand went on those calves and you had to be there and know every brand and so they'd get them all branded square, but they'd, they'd get them in bunches of four, five, six thousand head on some of that. But anyway, uh, anytime anybody has any questions, why, feel free. I'm kind of informal, but uh, I was going to, uh, talking about the history, the Cheyenne Deadwood Stage Trail goes across it, and I was going to maybe have George say a few things. George has spent a lot of years up there excavating and doing a lot of archaeology work and he knows that area really well. Would, would you want to say a few things about it, George? Only if you're finished, you. I, 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 could, go, I could go on and on, but go I ahead. think they're probably tired of me. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and say a few things? Go ahead, Ross. Hey, I read, um, I've read a couple of books about that. The, the one book was written by a cowboy that died in 1905, but he was in the when he started, he was 12 years old, and he was working those drives from cattle. And the reason, they used to run the cattle over to Kansas City. But then they decided they'd run them up to Montana because they could keep them up there for a couple of years and fatten them up, mm -hmm. and then ship them to Chicago and make more money. And he talked about that they would have five drives and they always had about three or 4,000 cattle per drive, 
and he always he would work at the roundup and he always brought the last drive up and he said the reason that they stopped driving the cattle from Texas to Montana was because the homesteaders because their their trail drive would maybe be three miles wide mm -hmm. and they'd come through town and people raise hell because they tore up their gardens and everything else so then they put the railroad in so then they started hauling the cattle from Texas to Montana and the railroad and that's when he moved to Montana and like you said there were a number of English uh, noblemen up there that had a lot of big ranches and things and they were involved in fact is there was one guy that started polo and uh, the uh, the cowboys that he trained on his polo farm beat some of the world's best polo players that bring them up there <laughs> I'll write them. but anyway it was very interesting but that was one of the reasons why they started going to Montana because they wanted to beat the market that they were getting in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So they could ship them all the way to Chicago. And they had better grass in Montana. Well, when you, when you talk about the evolution of the livestock industry, that 1887 winter got people to irrigating. And, and uh, my great-grandfather started the Bridger Ditch Ferry. Bridger Ferry Ditch Company. They diverted the first water out of the Platte River and started putting it on meadows. So there was that one. Uh, I would say right up there when people talk to me about what, what has really improved the livestock industry, it would have to be sail barns and trucks. Because yeah. uh, all the time, Dad was, all the time he was young even, which it wasn't that long ago, but through the 30s, 40s, and even uh, part of the 50s, they had to take their cattle and load them on the railroad and then they'd go 600 miles to Omaha. There was a place they could send them in South Dakota and Chicago, of course, and Omaha. But uh, I think the shortest one was 600 miles and you, you just seldom ever could, you'd have a few dry cows or whatever and you'd have to, a lot of them would ride all the way to train, if they shipped big herds of cattle, they'd ride the train back there, but it was quite a, it was quite a job to get anything sold. You had to trail to a railroad and put them on. So I would say the irrigation and the trucks and the sail barns. Sail barns, that you, we're, we're so lucky to have sail barns here close. Well, and you know also, because of that drought in 89, 88 and 89, mm -hmm. and the, the loss of all the cattle, mm -hmm. that's when Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kids started their, ga their gang because they were working on cattle ranch and they, there weren't any cattle because they lost them all so they got laid off and there was one guy in the group that had been a, a semi-gangster mm -hmm. so he told me he said hey listen we could get some money if we just robbed these trains mm -hmm. and that's how that that gang started it was because of that drought in 89 89 well uh this is what I had read today to go along with what you had mentioned <clears throat> as far as the uh, homesteaders. He says, we rounded up, and this is part of that roundup he was doing. He says, we rounded up Crow Creek to the old Camp Stool Ranch, then back to the head of Lone Tree Creek, Windy Hollow and south to Jack Springs in Colorado. We made one roundup south and west of Jack Springs and got into the farming country. And the farmers came out on the fight as they thought we were driving through and taking their cattle. About 20 of them came out when we had rounded up. They rode in and started cutting out their cattle. Most of them were in the fields at work when the alarm was sounded and did not take the trouble to remove the chain harnesses from their horses. It made the cattle wild to see the fellows chasing through the roundup, riding bareback and blind bridle and with the harness chains rattling. And it kept the cowboys busy to hold the cows in the country until the roundup foreman could cut some of them out. So. But it did get awfully difficult to, when they started homesteading and fencing and it got well, off. The other thing they said was the cattle that would get a sore foot or something, they put leather on them. But then when they got on the Indian country and the Indians wanted to trade money to cross, mm -hmm. they'd give them the sick cows because the sick cows were slowing them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wanted to keep moving. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, you want to say a few things, Mom, about what you had written down, or no. you you got your notes, sir? You, you. 
George, you want to visit with them a little bit about the Cottonwood Creek and some of the archaeology up there? All right. Uh, If you remember back to that first picture up there that was on the screen, uh, that's some of, you know, when I was state archaeologist, I had the privilege of, of being in some of the most isolated, desolate, and nooks and crannies all over the state of Wyoming. And in my opinion, that Hartville up left, that country up there where the ranch is, is one of the most beautiful pieces of country in the state of Wyoming. I really do believe that. And uh, over the years, I got to know the Hagemans pretty well, and, and we were running a youth program. And uh, Jim and Miriam gave us the privilege of just going up there every year and uh, with this youth program and exploring the history and archaeology of that area up there. It's a fascinating area. People have lived up in that heart. They'll up there for over 13,000 years. The first people in the, in, on this American continent. Uh, right up there in that heart to look, but there's over five mammoth sites up in that area. Uh, and I think the reason it's worked so well for the Hagemans and other ranchers up there and also for these prehistoric people was that it's kind of a unique environment. You go off to the east and you're out on the open plains. And there are certain resources available out there that are available the other direction. And if you go farther west from there, up into the mountains, there are certain resources up there that aren't available anywhere else. But you get in between, right, this is uh, kind of an eco zone right here, and you've got the two resources mixed together. So you have a higher concentration of resources that people need to survive and live on, concentrated in this one area. So it's a really attractive area for prehistoric people as well as historic people. And uh, I'll just run through this real quick. Uh, this first picture, uh, there's a place on the Hageman Ranch up there called the Myers Homestead. Uh, and right at the Myers Homestead there's a spring and there's this really uh, <coughs> good stratified Indian campsite right there uh, next to the Myers Homestead. If you look in that picture you can see right at the top there's a fire pit. You can part way down there's another fire pit and then there's uh, down another level another fire pit and there's a big fire pit right at the bottom. Uh, clear back to 2,500 years of stratified campfires right there. And there's more down below, but we couldn't dig any deeper because we got into the water table there. And who knows how far back that goes. On downstream, there's another little site, and we have a date of 10,000 years of that, that site on downstream, a place we call Hageman Narrows. Next slide. Uh, this is the Myers Homestead, uh, Charlie Myers' place up there. Uh, Another real interesting place, there was a baby grand piano in that place at one time. It was a place where the school board used to meet and so on and so forth. And a lot, just a lot of history goes along with all these homesteads, and I won't go into all that. Just, but look at that environment. Look at that country back there, you know. Uh, next slide. Another homestead, this is the Reed Homestead up there. I don't know if any of you knew Marie Potter. Uh, Marie died here at 100, age 100 five or six years ago, and that was her family's homestead up there when she was just a little girl. Originally it was a dugout, and her father uh, moved down there from Lusk and, and made a dugout and put his family in that dugout, and he went back to Lusk and went to work, come back on weekends and put that uh, log building together for him to stay. It had quite a place. It had a parlor in there where the kids weren't allowed to go and where the preacher would meet once in a while on Sunday. But I'm not going to go into a lot of that, but there's a lot of that kind of historic history up there, too. You know, up Cottonwood Drive, there was actually a community up there one time, back during the Depression years, they called Cottonwood. And a lot of people moved up there. They, they were desperate. They didn't have anything. But it was a place where they could get firewood, they could get shelter. And uh, so they just kind of moved on to the land. They didn't own it. They just moved on to it. And after the Depression, uh, some of them left. Some of them had to be forcibly missed moved off the property. But anyway, go on, next slide. Uh, Doc Brownrigg, uh, 1900, a guy by doctor by the name of Brownrigg, a horse and buggy doctor, moved into that community up there. Next slide. And this was his home and hospital uh, located just, just north of, uh, actually in, in, just west of some of your property up yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So, 
an old hand hewed building. Uh, next slide. A lot of caves up there. The area is just loaded with uh, what we call tool stone, the kinds of uh, material people need to make their stone tools out of. These people sometimes are camping in caves. There's several different caves up there. There's teepee rings. There's campsites. It's just loaded with, with prehistoric stuff as well as historic sites. Next slide. There's a teepee ring on Case Beer Hill up there. Hundreds and hundreds of teepee rings up in that area. Next slide. Burials. We find a few burials. This is a grave in uh, right on the uh, county line. County line draw. Next slide. And that was a young, about a 17 year old girl that uh, had been murdered. She had two projectile points in her, and it, it uh, dated about 1700 years ago. Kind of an interesting grave. Next slide. This is a place that I don't think Hugh has seen yet. And Jim, I was always told Jim about it. I was always going to take him up there. It's tucked way back, nestled into the uh, a draw up there in the in the hills, in the haystacks. And uh, there's a spring down below it, and it's hard to see in this picture, but you can see how those rocks are walled up right there, and they make a circle, and up against that big flat rock back there. And it's probably a thing that we think was a, probably a vision quest lodge. It fits all the criteria for what is, we would call a vision quest lodge. Mm -hmm. And someday we need to go up there yeah. and do a little more poking around and see what else we can learn about. It. Next slide. Uh, the government farm, uh, the military. You know, the trail up Cottonwood Draw was, uh, it's an old, old trail. The Indians, of course, used it for years and years. It was a major trail from Fort Laramie to, to the country north. Uh, one of the reasons uh, people use that trail was there's lots of water. Yeah, grazing for your, your animals when you're going up through that trail. Uh, the military used it when they went north and they had a place up there they called the government farm where they, it's kind of a sub-irrigated area where they made hay for the horses down at the fort and, uh, and they tried to raise their garden up there and vegetables for the fort too. They had to abandon it, abandon it in 1878 when the uh, red cloud ran them clear out of the country and they had to stay down south. Plats of the military had to desert it at that time. Next slide. Uh, those caves, there's rock art up there. Uh, there's one little cave up there where the Indians were quarrying tool stone back into this bank to get their uh, material for their stone tools. And you crawl back in there on your back and look up, and there's this handprint done in red ochre uh, on the roof of that cave. Next slide. And another one up there, uh, north of Guernsey, a uh, picture, there's a, a grizzly bear in the center of that picture. We originally thought it was a buffalo, but if you look at the feet real close, there's claws on it, and a stick figure on each end, and there looks like they're killing that grizzly bear. Boy, there's a lot of that kind of archaeology up there as well. Next slide. And uh, Spanish diggings, uh, one of the major tool stone quarries in uh, world-renowned one of the largest tool stone quarries on the American continent. But there's tool stone quarries all over the Hagelin Ranch up there. I just, uh, I, I hate to try and count them, just hundreds and hundreds of them. Next slide. One buffalo kill site that we know of an area up there, this is a little closer to JM. It's an old buffalo kill site, dates back to uh, about 8,000 years ago. Uh, it was the uh, form of the old, rare, extinct kind of bison. Next slide. And that's all I have with you. I just, what I wanted to do was just, you know, uh, show you just how rich that area is up there in history and, and prehistory. And it is such a beautiful area too. And I do thank the Hagemans for all the years that we were allowed to go up there with our youth program and explore the history and archeology span of that area. Yeah, we appreciate it. You and George both, you, you talk about that uh, Cheyenne Deadwood stage, and I'm reading a source that says it went through the uh, Eureka Canyon. You know where Hartville is? No, it didn't. Well, this book says it does. It's Bob McCarroll's Sunrise book. Yeah, you can, you can, Again. there's lots of uh, fallacious stories about where that trail went. 
Yeah, People will find an west. old building or something and say this must be where Yeah, that's too far west. Yeah, that's yeah. what I always thought. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm glad to know that. But there's lots of stories like that that people, oh, there's this old foundation building. This must have been a stage stop or something, you know. But, uh, and most of them aren't. Mm -hmm. But there is a good one up there, too, called the 10 Mile one, just 10 miles north of Fort Laramie. And there's a good story in, in that book uh, where Bronson went over one night, 40 below, and he could hear that stage coming and got on that stage. And, rode it on north to go up and recover some of his cattle that had been rustled out of his cattle herd. Mm -hmm. So just lots of that kind of history, but you know, we, we could talk two weeks about that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, so that's not what this program's about. There, there, was a, there was a story, there was so many stories told about old Charlie Myers, he showed you the, the Myers homestead and with the grand piano in there and whatnot, and, and uh, Charlie was a old time He's a pretty tough guy. He was pretty small, but he was pretty tough. And uh, he'd gotten wind that the school board was going to run buses, going to going to bus the kids. And he figured he was the biggest landowner around, said so make his property taxes go up too much. So he he'd uh, find out when the school board meeting was, and he would show up with his pistol, and he would break up the meeting so they couldn't vote. <laughs> and. This happened two or three times, and so they decided they better get the sheriff to come to the school board meeting, and the sheriff went to the school board meeting, and he wasn't allowed to break it up. But they voted for it, and they did hire him as a bus driver. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? I'm from Ohio, and water was never an issue, ever. People didn't even think about it for the most part. And so this irrigation, part of Wyoming fascinates me. I don't understand it at all. It's like the computer. But I am I correct that there was no irrigation on this ranch when your family first moved there? Is that right? Well, r right. As far as irrigation goes, there's still there's still still no irrigation up in that area. But uh, I guess I guess I'd be wrong in saying there was no irrigation there before we got there. Uh, when we moved to this place in 1961, there is a spot there on Cottonwood, on one of the draws in Cottonwood, where they brought. Uh, I think it's when they put the the uh, when guys came back from the war and there was nothing for them to do, and they built a dam up in that area. I think right after World War II, and they put a dam across Cottonwood Creek. And you can see some old ditches that Myers had in that area, and they irrigated out on some of those levels on each side of that creek up there. But the dam didn't last very long. There's some tremendous floods come through there. This this area right here, you just you can't believe how it floods. Um, when a gully washer comes through, it's there was one came through there in 2003. And it, uh, right in that area, it wasn't a very big area, but in the area of those hills right there, it dumped, uh, uh, I think it was nine, nine to 12 inches of rain in 90 minutes there. And, and uh, I was down at the house. We live down on the Platte River now, and we have irrigation there on the, off the, the uh, irrigation canal. And I was working on a swath there, and we only got two inches there. I just stepped inside the shop, waited for it to be done, I went down to the field to do some irrigating, and I looked up, and the Platte River just came up, just right before my eyes, it came up about 10 feet. And I thought, wow. So I went up and looked at Cottonwood, and uh, that was the year they had to put that, the signs there on that bridge where Cottonwood crosses Highway 26, uh, this side of Guernsey. And it took them till fall, but it, had, it knocked that bridge off the foundation there, and I, I don't know what the... I don't know what good it was supposed to do. They slowed traffic down there. You couldn't go over the bridge more than 40 miles an hour. But anyway, uh, just some tremendous flooding up there at times. But, so but when the cattle are out on the range, where are they getting the water? Are they well, Cottonwood Creek's a really good source of water. It's all live water. But uh, since the days when man came here to Wyoming in the 18... And start settling Wyoming in the 1860s, 70s, 80s. Uh, just been a lot of wells drilled for livestock, uh, reservoirs built. Uh, 
my grandfather, my dad's dad, it was my great grandfather that brought the cattle up, my dad's dad, grandfather, he was, they hired him to go around and survey and they were in Converse County and he, he did a lot of work. Uh, they put reservoirs in that country. They put reservoirs and caught rainwater. And there's still a lot of those out there, but he did a lot of that. He was a surveyor and whatever they wanted him to do, he would go do, but they, all over that, a lot of Converse County has reservoirs and things where they just catch runoff water. But runoff creeks, uh, of course, at, th at this time, that was my dad's point, was uh, uh, by storing that water and irrigating, it did make a lot more creeks live. There's a lot of creeks that have water in them that didn't used to that, um, store that water in the ground. Getting back to the Indians, kind of, is that Cottonwood Creek, is that the same area where I read the story where the Indians that killed the family, I believe, and took the little girl or something? Pro probably, yeah, I would assume, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, she was asking about the story where the Indians had killed the family and took the little girl. No, not that cottonwood. Not that cottonwood. That's another, a lot of cottonwood creeks. There's a lot of cottonwood creeks in Wyoming. Was that the one more towards Wheatland? Over? Okay. This is right below the old Myers homestead and that's a canyon that just where the water just cuts right straight through it we were right down the creek from here the Myers homestead sits right back here and this homestead sits just down the creek from this but uh, I never have seen it I always wanted to be there it's just haphazard if you're there you don't really want to be there but I would like to see when a flash flood goes through there because uh, I guess I think dad saw it one time was all but it crashes through there because it narrows down here and these walls are hundreds some of these walls are several hundred feet high in this canyon and so and it you know it's got it uh, has some German brown trout these are nice deep pools in there it's it's really a good creek it runs it hardly ever varies it'll it'll run a little further down sometimes in a wet year but all this area the creek never varies it never is higher it never is lower it doesn't matter if it's dry or wet or whatever it's it's a constant flow so, it was a really good place to grow up for kids it was pretty hard on mom because the creek ran right by the house <laughs> and uh, she couldn't keep the kids out of the creek it was kind of a dangerous place but the six of us that were left were pretty smart <laughs> but yeah it was a it was a it was a really good place to grow up you know, the rocks and the hills and the trees and there was never any boredom we were never outside of the creek we were um, I got into trouble one time I left home with uh, my younger sister Harriet that went we didn't have a road that got all the way to the house. From the east, you had to park your vehicle and walk over one of these hills. And I came home with my dad one night in a truck, because he spent a lot of time over on the O-10. That, was his, that would have been his uncle that was on the O-10 over near Linda Nichols. And we came in one night, and I told him not to leave me the next day, and he did. So when I got up, he was gone. So I grabbed Harriet and we headed over the hill and we got over there and he was gone, but we decided there was a lot still to do and never thought about what time it was or anything. And kind of later in the day, we decided to, we better maybe get back home. And we headed back over and we ran into my older brother. He was on a horse looking for us. And he told us how much trouble we were in. And so, uh, <laughs> Mom couldn't get on a horse because she was pregnant with my youngest brother, but uh, we figured it up and I was three and Harriet was one and a half. And we had spent the whole day out there and she was pretty upset with us. So. <laughs> I suppose it would make you nervous, wouldn't it? If you... <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got, we got Charlie there. Charlie. <laughs> Sweet. 
Any more questions or? I, we do have some, a uh, uh, couple of, I did bring a couple photo albums here with some pictures of the, of the ranch and whatnot. Feel free to, to look at those or, um, or if there's any questions or. Whatever happened to the Soderbergs? Uh, Paul's the only one that's left and they'd sold the ranch and he lives I think five or six seven miles north of Lusk. Oh he does? Yep. Oh. Yep. I often wondered about him because I, yeah. I lost contract yeah. with him but yeah. I just I just well when you said uh -huh. Paul why then yeah. the light came on. Yeah. They were yeah. quite a bunch of guys. They were. Yep. He told me a while back um, his oldest sister I think his oldest sister was born in Sweden in uh, 1906, and he was born in 1932. So there's quite a span where they. I can't remember. I think there was eight or ten of them. Yeah, there but, was. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Either eight or ten of those guys. Yeah. 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 My great grandfather's family. There were twelve of them. And. Uh, and he had uh, seven kids, and uh, the the one just older than my grandmother died, uh, drowned in the river crossing the river on his horse there by the ranch at Orange Junction. Did you have snakes out there? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a few rattlesnakes. Uh, we used to. That was one of the past times we had were the rattlesnakes in that area. We had one crawl under this old house one time and mom and dad always had extra kids there. We always had neighbors or something and they, mom was there by herself with six or seven kids and we'd had a rattlesnake crawl under the porch and we, we couldn't get to him and we, we tried all day and couldn't get him out. And anyway, uh, dad came home that night and uh, he just got a garden hose and kind of squirted him in there and he squirted him a little bit and that, that snake crawled out and crawled out in front of him and just laid there, didn't even look up. Said that snake was so worn out from our harassment all day that he, he had no fight left in him whatsoever. Well, one of the pastimes we had when we were real little is we liked to gather the eggs and we didn't, of course, give the chickens even time to lay the eggs because we were constantly going to gather the eggs and there was one nest that was up above my head and so I went in there and I reached in there to see if there was any eggs and I got a hold of a big bull snake. So I ran and got dad and, of course, all the kids ran up there and I can remember, I think it was Julie and Rachel had these brand new outfits. And back then they were called pedal pushers, you know, they came up, I think they're capris now. But anyway, they had these brand new nice outfits on and everybody gathered around and dad pulled that snake out of that nest and pulled him out there on the ground and he had lumps, you know, all the way down him where he'd eaten those eggs and he chopped that snake and it sprayed egg yolk and snake blood and everything all over those two girls. It <laughs> You know, uh, there's a lot of mountain lions in there right now, and the deer just won't hardly stay back there. The deer have kind of moved down on the river and whatnot, and you see some deer, but not like there should be. But mountain lions are kind of bad back in there. And, uh, a lot of coyotes. Coyotes are, it's kind of seasonal, you know. Uh, we think we had a calf killed here a w couple weeks ago, a week or ten days ago, when they're real little. But for the most part, the coyotes, they, they got to get pretty bold and kind of run in a pack before they'll, you know, they, they kill newborns. Uh, gets kind of scary around calving time. We get a lot of coyotes. The boys work on them all the time. But uh, 
Uh, once the calves get very much age on them, you, you really don't have too much trouble with the coyotes. Sheep, um, that was a different story. We just couldn't have sheep. They just were, you couldn't keep them out. Now? Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This has been a wonderful program. And we could keep you here all night. You know that from stories. But we always give our speakers, even, even special ones, one of the calendars. I appreciate so, that. Yeah. And Thank you. for you, madam, Mother of the Year, you get a calendar too. I, I am so impressed. So, <laughs> because you have obviously raised a wonderful family and gone through a lot. <laughs> Absolutely a lot. So I've had a wonderful life. Yes, I can see you have. You better write the book. So, thank you all for coming, and I hope you'll be here next next time when we have a program on the POWs and World War II. So, in the meantime, have a good night, and thank you. Thank you.